Nobody can start time until right now. And I'm going to try to do better because our, our presentation has gotten longer each time. And since I'm standing still at this mic, it may be a little bit. So, we're here. Uh, the purpose of this public hearing is to re receive input about the proposal that streets, the street team has put together to build a new elementary school. Um, earlier, last, well, last school year, our board voted, which is a requirement by state law, voted to consolidate from four elementary schools to two elementary schools. So that part of the process is done. We have we had four public hearings on that. The board, board voted to consolidate from four to two and chose the site for the new elementary school to be built, which is Van Pell. We all, that was also part of the four public hearings that we've already had. So tonight, we're here to get input from the public, from our staff, from our parents, from our students, city council members, everybody that's here about what this new school that we're building should have and what, what changes should be made and so on and so forth. To answer questions about the finance. Anyway, we'll go through a, a lot of things. So this is the third or fourth. We finish up our fourth public hearing tomorrow night. Our board is at We only have to have one. Our board is at Concerns and needs are very different. Um, you know, Van Pills, the concerns there were all about traffic, and the traffic that would be in that neighborhood. How do you have a whole different set of concerns? And tomorrow night, Stonewall will have a completely different set of concerns. So, kudos to our board for, uh, you know, they work regular jobs for the most part, uh, and then they kind of, you know, at least feel
infrastructure is outdated that includes plumbing, electrical, and HVAC, and our kitchen needs improvements, but there's no room to expand. Uh, there's also a lack of storage. Uh, we, our bus lane and our car lane at all three of those schools are the same lane, which is not recommended by the state, although it is allowed under the grandfather clause. Have limited parking, uh, sidewalks, stairs, etc. if you are not up to code, and our elevator and intercom systems are no longer serviceable. That's not true here, that's true at Stonewall Jackson and Washington League, and we've been told on the elevator at Stonewall Jackson, if it breaks down, if they have a part of the truck, we'll fix it. If they don't, the elevator is completely out of service from that time forward. Uh, the intercom systems are the same way. Uh, they're both in need of repair, but they, they don't have the parts are no longer made to fix this. Last year, we had to replace the intercom system at Virginia High School. It was over $100,000 a year. Uh, of course, we mentioned that the Highland View has been being funded by obsolete, and as you'll see in a little bit, the renovation costs are unaffordable and but also from the city's debt capacity standpoint also unfinanceable. So the next question is where? Uh, our board had to pick a location for the new school to be built. So we identified any property in the city that was greater larger than 10 acres, which is what is required for a school of that size. We selected 13 properties to evaluate. We invited the public to ride home. We took a bus one Saturday. We, we drove all over the city, got out and checked out the properties in some locations. And, and our staff all completed the rubric with many different items on it. And then they rated each of those sites for the best suitability for the new school. And, and we narrowed that down to five properties that are at least in the fifth board meeting. And from those five properties, uh, our school board chose Van Hill. There was a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the first one being the, the owner was the city of Bristol. And as you can see, the price to purchase Van Hill was, was pretty reasonable. We already owned it, and so there was no cost to purchase it. The topography was mostly flat, so the grading costs were not be, uh, they're not going to be very significant. The utilities are already on site. The sites we looked at, for example, after we per if we were to choose that site, after we purchased it, we were going to have to spend somewhere between two hundred and fifty and four hundred thousand dollars just to get the utilities to it. Uh, and from a central location, as you know, Van Hill geographically is not very central in Bristol. But if you look at where our students live, it actually is. Seventy-five percent of our students live within a three-mile radius of Van Hill. That inner circle is a one-mile radius from Van Hill. The middle circle is a three-mile radius. And then that outer circle is a five mile radius. And so you see the students that live outside of that three mile radius, that they're the ones in yellow, and that is the uh, Stonewall Jackson attendance zone. So, how I'm definitely not going to read this slide to you. Uh, there's a lot on it, but I'll tell you the important things. Um, we received an unsolicited proposal, uh, which opened up this entire process. We uh, then, after we accepted that proposal, we opened it up for other people to submit. The key to that was, before we would even review it, we charged $10,000 just to review the proposal. And so we got two, we received two proposals. So we took that $20,000 and we hired a construction consultant who just walked in. Well, we were just glad to have you here from Skanska. And we also hired an attorney to take us through a very detailed Public Private Education Act PPEA process. And so even though, um, you know, it, it is going to cost the city an amount of money to hire those individuals, I certainly don't have the expertise to navigate us through that, but we're going to be able to do that without having a great expense to the city. Um, so now we've received those two proposals. We, we got a really good one from a local contractor and a, and a local architect team with a financer that has a nationwide, uh, a nationwide presence and street. They're here with us tonight as well. And so now our board has given me the authority to begin negotiations to um, hopefully make it an even better deal than the one we have now. We have the next steps are having public hearings, which we're in the process of doing. Our board will approve a comprehensive agreement, which we hope to do at our October 1st meeting. However, we may not be at that point. We may have to do a special call meeting in October to complete that. And then find the final step will be for council, city council, to approve that comprehensive agreement. So what? Well, this is really important. Hopefully you had an opportunity to see our, our banners, our posters that we have up here. If not, 
lot of you have seen it in the paper, we have a very uh, all-inclusive website that has every document that we've used throughout this process. But, uh, one of the things that I'm proud of about this design is we currently are trying to educate students for jobs that we don't even know what they are. I, was, I met with my student advisory team today at Virginia High School and I pulled out my cell phone and, and told, told them what an amazing invention that that was. The ability to uh, send a written message to somebody just like that, to call somebody while you're driving down the road, to to search something called the WWW. I mean, that was when I was in high school, which was a good while ago, but still, that was not even imagined. And so the, the technology is advancing even faster now, and so we're preparing our students to do things that don't even exist right now. It's hard to do that in a building that was built when FDR was president, and that was the vision of our future. So all of our learning spaces were built or were designed with collaboration in mind. We know that students have to have these skills, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity, uh, computer skills, good citizenship skills, and this building was designed via the architect with all those things in mind. My, one of my favorite parts of it was actually, it wasn't even intended. Um, they designed this with two computer labs. If you're not aware, all Bristol Virginia Public School students from second grade to 12th grade, we provide them with a laptop. And so we don't need a computer lab at the new intermediate school. And so those two computer labs are going to be enrichment labs. I have no idea what that's going to be. But I'll tell you some things about what it could be. It might be a maker space. It might be a science lab, which we currently do not have in any of our elementary schools. It may be a Legos robotics lab. It may be a sensory room for children with autism or attention deficit. The possibilities are endless and only, only stop by our imagination. And so I look forward to that part of designing those classrooms with our teachers, with our students, with our communities, because that is one of the things that's going to make this, this building special. Um, 85,000 square feet, that is a really large building. Uh, most class, all regular classrooms will be 800 square feet, which is what our state of Virginia recommends. It will have a full high school size gymnasium, a 1,300-foot access road, and actually through these double carriages, we've got a couple of suggestions that we may talk about tonight that, that we may make that road a little bit shorter and save some money. Um, that's new to you guys, I know, but anyway, I'll share that here in just a second. <clears throat> so we also will have separate bus drop-off and car drop-off lanes, which is a much, much safer environment for our students. Of course, the building, now that it's been being built to 2018 code, will be totally ADA accessible. Uh, the, the heating and cooling units will be rooftop units. All fire alarms and things like that will be up to code. LED lighting, which is uh, much more economical. And it's designed with a 50-year life expectancy. Now, 50 years, this building is 81 years old, and we have certainly got our use out of this building. Current industry standards are not built to 50 years. Our attorney, uh, who has been through this process a lot, that was one of the things that he negotiated for us very early on in Curtis as well, that this, this building had to be uh, built above industry standards. And so that's why how we ended up with a 50-year life expectancy. I'm not going to read these to you as well, but you can see a detailed breakout here of what that floor plan over there says. But it is uh, some things that are included on there are physical therapy, occupational therapy room, a couple of speech therapy rooms, um, of course, special education resource rooms, special education uh, in inclusion rooms. It is going to have everything we need. It will have a separate art room and a separate music room. Write that question down. I see you looking there. We'll get it in just a second. Um, and here's the floor plan. It's a U-shaped building. Uh, there will be a, in the middle, as you see in the, in the center of that view, uh, we'll have a great space for students to use. The gym will be here. Van Pell will be here. We'll have a service room, which you'll see in a second. And so we can open up the gym and the cafeteria to the public without opening up the remainder of the building. Some things that have come out of the public hearing that we're going to add is we're, we're going to add some doors here, 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 so if we were, heaven forbid, if we were to get into an active shooter situation, we could lock down whatever part of that building was and contain it to that one area. 
place my hand. So I must have to feel like you all want. So you can see the footprint. Uh, this is Van Pelt as it stands now. Some Chris Drive goes from here out to Bottom Road. Heritage Drive comes up here and hits Colony. And then we have over here Grand View. And so as you can see, this is the 1,300 foot road that we've talked about. And so currently the plan would be that this would be the parent drop-off lane. So you would come here and pick up your primary age student, your intermediate age student, and hit the road. Oops. And then buses under the current plan would do the same thing. They would follow this loop, pick up, pick up, and hit the road. So a suggestion actually was made this week that if you took this road and made it straighter, which might also, also make that safer, then you can save some money. You could do this as your bus lane, do this as your car rider lane, and you wouldn't have any issues with queuing it up and you would save money along the way. So that's the beauty of having these public hearings. Our group truly listens. Many of the things that you see in the site plan have already have come apart because of either public hearings or because of committees where we have Mr. Hartley actually serves on the hands and teachers. Anyway, we have about 18 people on that committee, uh, parents, teachers, special ed teachers, community members, city council members, school board members, and they have been part of not only the design process for the new school, but also for the renovation that we have to take place at Main Hill. So this has been very well done with our school members. And that's what it looks like. And I am as proud of that uh, as anything I've been proud of in the at least in a long time. You know, currently, if we're trying to attract business and industry to our area, one of the, there's two things that people ask. Where will I live? And where will my kids go to school? And as we're bringing those folks in to say, hey, please bring your business to Bristol. We, you know, we want your jobs. To bring them to Highland View to show them this is where your kids will go to school. Even though our teachers are phenomenal, but we can call our staff, and I'm going to talk about your guys here in just a second, too. They are phenomenal. But when you look at this building, it's not very impressive. It's, and it's actually, I mean, the lighting in here is not what it ought, it ought to be. If you were at the Van Pell meeting the other day, that environment was much more conducive to having a meeting such as this. But this will help us attract business and industry as well as providing a 21st century learning experience for our students. Um, I have a student advisory team at Virginia High School, and I met with them today, and we talk about a couple of things that I want to talk about that we open up the floor for them to share with me things that they want me to fix. One result of that is we got macaroni and cheese back on the cafeteria menu last year. So that's some of the things, and that's a big deal because we have really good macaroni and cheese. But they, as we were talking today, I asked all the students to raise their hand and they went to such and such elementary school. Well, I was very proud that Highland View was overrepresented. These students were chosen because of their leadership capabilities. So, how do these students leave here? I know that's a focus for the state, but they leave here with great leadership skills. So, we started talking about the buildings. And two of the seniors, one of them just happens to be our starter quarterback for the football team, um, they were talking about how much they love their teachers and how much those relationships meant to them and how they love their small class sizes. And then they said, but. But it's unfair that we had to go to that school when all of our classmates were going to Van Pelt. And I thought that was very telling. But let me finish the story. The Van Pelt kids then said, we think it was unfair because you had those small classes. We had 24 or 26 kids in our class. We had an open classroom model. We couldn't hear a thing the teacher was saying. And so what is really awesome about this new plan is that though both of those problems go away. We don't have students in aging buildings that have been deemed functionally obsolete. And we don't have class sizes that are so large and open classrooms that are so uh, distracting that students can't learn. Our average class sizes, most classes in this new plan will be 19 students. So we'll have a few classes with 18 students and we'll have a few classes with 20 students. That's using today's enrollment numbers by grade. And so some of our grades have 150 students, some of our grades have 170 students. 
So depending on where you fall here, that's what the class size is going to look like. Currently, we have 24 kindergartners in three, we have three classes of kindergartners at Banff Hill with 24 students each in. Here, we have kindergarten classes, and uh, it's 12 or 13 students in kindergarten classes here. And that's a big difference. And it's a great benefit for Highland View students, but it's, it's a detriment to the students who are being held. The same is true as Stonewall Jackson. In one of our older buildings, we have 21 kindergarten students in each class. Um, however, in pre K, we have very few pre K students, but at Washington League, we were busting out the Sims with pre K students. So now our division is busting some of our Washington League students in pre K to the pre K program at Stonewall Jackson just to, just to keep the numbers even. So that's, that's kind of the thing that we have. Having one primary school and one intermediate school will address that issue. So, how much? This is probably, for some folks, the most important part of the, the presentation. This proposal contains a 30 year triple net lease. What, the way that it'll work is that this company will purchase, will lease the ground that we have at Van Hill, and then they will add improvements to the land, improvements being the new school. And after they add those improvements, which will be the building, two years from, from basically from now, then we will begin leasing the building from them. So the whole, for the next 30 years, they'll be leasing land from us, and we'll be leasing, leasing the building from them, and that is what enables us to go through this project. Our city, there's a law in Virginia that says a locality cannot exceed the debt margin, um, the legal debt margin, and that is a, a, a formula that looks at appraisals of homes and properties in the area and how much you owe. And we have very little space. We don't have enough space to take on any additional debt. Because this is a lease, and because of the setup of this, it doesn't count towards that debt margin. And so that's, this is the only financing mechanism available for us to build a new school. It'll be a decade at least before the city is able to get that debt margin down enough to where they can afford to, to take on additional debt without taking them back up to that debt margin. So this is, this financing plan, in my opinion, has been a godsend. The lease payment is $1.2 million annually. The lifetime cost for the $18 million building would end up being $37 million. Um, now, what that would end up costing is a little over $8 million because we, our, this proposal says that because of personnel and operational savings, that we, we won't need to have an additional appropriation as compared to our 2017 18 appropriation. Um, but it, it, you're probably aware that our local budget, our local appropriation was cut by $300,000 this past year. And so, what we're asking, the only thing we're asking the city to do two years from now is to give us $250,000 of that $300,000 back, and that's all we need to make this time. And it's, you know, that is. I don't know of any other school division anywhere, not just in the Commonwealth, anywhere that has been able to have a deal like this where the building of the new school does not include an additional appropriation from the council. <clears throat> so, anyway, we hope that it's even better because I'm really going to try to negotiate. Curtis and I are going to hang up on, on the street team and we're going to try to get an even better deal as we move forward. But don't tell her that because uh, we're trying to keep that a secret. Now, one of the questions that's been asked a lot is, why don't you just renovate these older buildings? Well, we, so the mayor said, I want to see the numbers. I want to see what it would cost to do several different renovation scenarios. And so this first bar that you see here, that's $8.5 million. dollars. Well, that, that, that's the new school. And what that represents is the $250,000 that we're asking for the city to give back to us times 30 plus some loose change. And that's what gets us to eight and a half million dollars. That is over 30 years. That's what it's going to cost the city as compared to this year's appropriation to build the new school. Now, as compared to last year's appropriation, that number's on the zero. The next numbers you're going to see are what it costs just to renovate. This, those next numbers do not include financing at all. You probably remember I said the building cost $18 million to build. 
we were going to, it was going to cost us $37 million over the 30 years. So if we apply that same principle to the renovation costs, you could basically double in and see what it would cost the city over 30 years to complete those renovations. And so here's what the scenarios are. Renovate, keep all four elementary schools open, renovate them. And once you do a renovation, a major renovation to a, a school or any, any building, you have to bring it up to current code. And so you're looking to say $42 million to renovate that. Well, when you look at bringing these buildings up to current code, that is a huge, huge endeavor. So to renovate our four existing schools, $42 million before any financing. One of the recommendations that City Council has asked us to look at is to close Highland View, the building that we're in now, our oldest elementary school, and then consolidate all the students here with Van Pell. Now, in order to do that, we would have to add an addition on Van Pell. So the cost to, and then we would have to renovate Stonewall Jackson, and renovate Washington Lee, add an addition on Van Pell, demolish this building. You're looking at 31, almost 32 million dollars before violence. You can see very quickly the math just doesn't add up. You look at renovating the closing on view, renovating the other three, moving all fifth graders in the division to the middle school, all eighth graders in the division to the high school, doing doing a, an add-on at Virginia High to accommodate that, and you're looking at 33 million dollars. That same scenario and repurposing space at Virginia High instead of doing an addition there is actually the most economical, not the most uh, ideal, and that's $27 million. I'll remind you one more time, that's before finance. We can build a brand new school for $18 million, $37 million over, over 30 years, with truly a cost of only $8 million as compared to this year's appropriation. But, you know, I, I think we needed to have that exercise. These numbers were not made up by me. They were made up, they were provided by a very, very well respected school architect, mostly architects, um, out, of, out of Richmond. And so those numbers are real and legit. They're not my numbers. I'm just reporting. So, how do we have the savings? Personnel, about $865,000. Uh, that's because by combining those schools, Class size is changing up. We will be able to save some positions. Uh, operational, $121,000. I'll tell you that we are throwing money out the window right now on these old buildings. We did everything we can up to this point that we could financially afford to do to make them energy efficient. It's just very hard to make a 1938 building energy efficient. Um, so if you look at our 2017-18 appropriation, it was almost $7 million. This year, our appropriation was reduced by $300,000, which puts us at almost six point seven. And what we're asking for, not this year, not next year, but the following year, is to get that appropriation almost back to where it was last year at six point nine thirty six. And so that total, the restoration of $250,000 added to the savings that we think we can Generate, and let me tell you, that is a very conservative estimate. We, we probably will realize more than personnel savings. Is almost, you'll see, is almost the amount of the annual payment for the new school. And that's how, if you've heard us talk about being budget neutral, that's how we're saying it is budget neutral. So, who? This is a very important question. Who? Who will this impact? Well, currently we have four elementary administrators. We will only need three elementary administrators. Uh, we will, there will be five grade level teachers uh, that we will be able to absorb as a result of that uh, consolidation. One elementary PE teacher, one media specialist, which is a librarian, uh, one guidance counselor, or I should say professional school counselor. I've uh, got to get that right. Um, one clerical staff. One, well, basically one and a half nurses, that's not a half person, that's half a position. We currently have one of those in the division already, and then three custodians. Now, I know this is a question on teachers' minds, especially if you're a grade level teacher. Well, last year, over the summer, we hired over 20 teachers. The year before that, I think it was 18. Ms. Jones, remind me of the average. The average is 20. We average hiring 20 teachers. 
teachers every school year. And so we believe, we, we are, can almost guarantee the grade level teachers will be absorbed through attrition. Those positions where you see just one person, you know, where it's say one position, maybe, maybe not. I mean, those may be where we have to make some tough decisions. I take this board who doesn't want to have to uh, lay anybody off. We're going to do everything we can to keep all of our people and absorb it through attrition. But we really believe that, that most of this will take care of itself. And where it doesn't take care of itself, I can assure you that our board will go to any means necessary to make sure that our people are taken care of. Why now? People have talked about, oh, why are you in such a big hurry? Why do you want to rush this? Well, last time I checked, 2011 was a long time ago. And that's when we started this process. It has certainly sped up since uh, 2017, and we've started getting a lot more traction, and that's because we now have a finance mechanism that we can do this with. However, that may not, the, the lucrativeness of that finance plan may not be available in the future. So let me tell you why now. Senator Stanley, who is from Franklin County area, has proposed legislation that, you may be aware, the Supreme Court has just ruled that states can start collecting in the sales tax. That has not been done in the past. Senator Stanley has asked, is asking the state legislature to earmark all those dollars for school construction. And so we're going to have an opportunity to take advantage of state money, which we've not had since 2008. The state used to provide money to help offset these costs. We have an opportunity to get state money to help with this. If that happens, City Council's burden is even less. He also, he has also asked the Attorney General to look at school construction as a civil rights issue. And I'll talk some more about that in just a second. Delegate Edmonds, he is from the Halifax County area, has proposed legislation for localities to be able to uh, levy a tax similar to the transportation tax that Northern Virginia issued a few years ago to help pay for roads up there. And so I think it's a, added, you can add a one and a quarter percent to your local sales tax rate, and every bit of that will go to school construction. Now, let me be clear. I'm not advocating that our city council add additional sales tax to our economy. Here is what I am saying, and this, and this next bullet shares that. If either of these two pieces of legislation pass, competition for building schools changes drastically. I'll give you, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but we had two proposals. One was from Virginia Beach, an area, the 757 area code, where they're building a lot of schools. Competition is, you know, there's a lot of competition where the contractors are getting bids and, and win bids and build schools. As you know, in Southwest Virginia, that's not happening. And so I think a lot of the concerns that folks have had about this process is that we're going to build this new school and we're going to be crammed into it. But because the competition is not so great here in Southwest Virginia currently, we ended up getting a much more school than we had ever thought that we were going to get from the street proposal. And so we were talking about dividing Van Pelt into Quince, five classrooms and those open classroom spaces, not necessary. We were talking about, uh, sorry, oh, she's gone so I can talk about it. We were talking about moving our music classroom from where it is at Van Pelt now into basically a janitor's closet. But you know, those were some of the things that we were going to have to do to build the new school. But because the, the uh, bid was so much better in Southwest Virginia than the one coming from the 757 area code, that's, that's not going to happen. Our, all of the renovations at Van Pelt will now be quads. We'll be dividing 4,800 square feet of space into four instead of into five classrooms. And so the, those issues of small class sizes are not going to be an issue. And so I'm not saying that Mr. Hartley or Mr. Wingard should live in additional tax, sales tax to pay for this, but I am saying that streets will have a lot more potential to build schools in Southwest Virginia and other parts of the state if either of these pieces of legislation Another thing is, we know this from owning a car, owning a house. If you wait till you have to do something, it puts you in a bad spot. If you wait till your, your car is broken down, it's a lot harder to get fixed than if you do regular maintenance. If we wait until we have to 
close Allen View, or we have to close Washington Lane, or we have to close Stonewall Jackson. Folks, I don't like the, I don't like the concept of what that would look like. I mean, that's a much different scenario. We need to take care of this when we should instead of when we have to. And then opportunity costs. And I'll talk about that here. So any builder will tell you this, that every year the cost to build goes up. Estimates range from 6.5%. We have an estimate of 10%. So we're providing estimates of inflation on building costs at that low end of 6.5%. If you follow any of the things going on in our economy, you know that interest rates are at a pretty good level now, but they're on their way up. And so these scenarios represent where we are currently, a payment of 1.25 million. If we wait one year and add inflation and 0.35%, that annual payment goes from 1.2 to almost 1.5. If that interest rate goes up by 0.6, then you're looking at a payment of over 1.5. And if you postpone it a year and that interest rate goes up by a full 1.1, now you're looking at over $1.6 million annually in opportunity costs. That's what, that is a cost to the taxpayers. Our plan, if we do it now, has no impact on the taxpayers. This plan, if we push it out anywhere into the future, certainly does. And so the total cost goes from currently 37 million, 0.35 takes the total cost to 44 million, 0.6 takes it over 46 million, and then now 1.1, you're talking about a total cost of almost 50 million dollars as compared to 37 million in the current plan. Oops. The difference there is 6 million for 0.35, 8 million for 0.6, and almost 11.5 million dollars if that interest rate goes up by 1.1. Now this, this information is a little bit different from what we presented at Washington Lee last week. It's the same as what we presented at Van Hill because when this proposal was submitted on August the 10th, our interest rate was at 4.55%. Most recent information, I should have changed this slide now because we've got a new update um, the other night, is increased by 0.10 to 4.65%. Right before the meeting at Van Pelt the other night, I got a message that the interest rate is now 4.7%. So that's changed again. That interest now, on a daily basis, that ebbs and flows. It goes up and down. But the last report we got, the interest rate, if we closed on it at that point, would be 4.75%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but here's what 0.1% of an interest rate does to your annual payment. $65,000 a year. Or, we, we, if we want to keep the payment where it is, we can do that too. But instead of getting an $18 million building, we get a $17 million building. Neither one of those are good options. And that's why I say from an opportunity cost standpoint, the time to do this is now. We can't afford, our city can't afford, our taxpayers can't afford to put this off another year. Now, I talked about several rights earlier. If you're familiar with Brown versus Board of Education, some of you probably live with it. I know some people in the room have. What Brown versus the Board of Education basically says is regardless of your status in society, your race, color, creed, religion, your, your income, you all students deserve an equal opportunity to a high-quality education. And Senator Stanley has asked Virginia's Attorney General to provide an opinion to see if Virginia is in violation of Brown versus Board of Education. Because what Senator Stanley says is happening in other places in the Commonwealth is also happening right here in Bristol. Let me tell you why. If you look at our district, 65% of our students qualify overall for free or reduced price lunch. At Van Pelt, that number is below 60%. That is our new, and that's our newest building. Washington Lee, 74% of our students uh, qualify for free lunch. One of our oldest buildings and actually in the second worst condition. Stonewall Jackson, 76%. Second oldest elementary school and in Highview, this school, 85% of our students receive free or reduced price for lunch. The building is 81 years old. So what we're saying is that our students who live, the majority of our students who live in poverty, it's okay to send them to our facilities that are in the worst condition. I don't think that's where Bristol intends to be. I don't think that's where Bristol should be. And 
And I, I hope that's not where Mr. ends up being at the end of this process. And then when you look at it from a minority standpoint, overall in the division, where 19% of our students are in minority status. Stonewall Jackson stays at the district level. Van Pelt's a little higher than that. But when you look at our two, two of our oldest and the two buildings that are in the worst condition, the minority percentages are at 28%, much higher than the, than the district average. So we're not only saying that our, our poorest students and families go to our worst facilities, but also our minority students go to our first facilities. That's not something I want to be part of. Our new plan corrects that. All of our students will have an equal opportunity. I was dozing off last night watching TV, and a commercial came on from Verizon, and my wife kind of nudged me, and I got a text message from, from a coworker sharing the video. And what that video said is it showed schools and conditions like ours, and the question was asked, if we're all created equal, why aren't our schools? If we're all created equal, why aren't our schools? Every student in the city of Bristol deserves an equal opportunity in the best facility that we can provide so that they can compete when they leave high school with students from Mountain County, Fairfax County, Arlington City, Roanoke, wherever else in the state that our kids are competing, they need to have every opportunity. Currently, we're not able to provide it. So, I ask, why not? Every decision, every major decision that you make in life, typically, you need to weigh the risk versus the reward. And so let's talk about the risk. You know, one of the questions that's come up is, will this have an effect on our debt capacity? We, the city's financial advisors, have told us unequivocally that it will not have an impact on, our, on the city's legal debt margin. We, uh, the mayor has asked, the city manager to get a, an opinion from the Attorney General. So hopefully that is in the process and we'll have an opinion from the Attorney General soon. Assume. There's also another financial concern to consider is our bond rating. Currently our bond rating has been going up because our city is making some really smart financial decisions. Uh, you know, a, a slight change to our bond rating really wouldn't have a big impact on us because we don't have the capacity to borrow anyway. However, we believe that if it does have even a minimal impact, it'll be, I mean, if any impact will be minimal, but in other localities, the impact of the bond rating of the plant like this or governmental buildings has been negligible. Um, there is a looming false payment. Anybody heard of the false project? Um, there's a payment coming to do on that one year after the first payment for the school was due. And so there are, there's some concern about, you know, what if we have to cut education further in order to be able to make that false payment? Well, I'll tell you this. Our city has done a great job in trying to get our finances under control. Our city manager, our CFO, and city council deserve a lot of credit for that. They've held every department accountable, and it, the results have paid off. Last year, in addition to $8 million that the city had in their reserve account, they have surplus of six million dollars. There's other financial um, gains that are coming to the city too. My recommendation to city council will be this: If you're concerned that our that our our financial position is not growing and increasing, take part of that fourteen million dollars that you have in the bank, set it aside, and if something happens that you feel like you need to cut the budget, you have money in a reserve account to do that. The mayor has actually suggested something very similar by taking part of that reserve and putting it in a school construction account. So even though I believe that is a risk, I think there's a very viable solution to address it. Traffic, um, you know, there's a lot of concern about traffic at Van Pelt. We've talked about that already. Sir, adding 600 additional students in a neighborhood community like Van Pelt will impact traffic. But we have, we have planned and worked to work with the city engineer and the city traffic uh, department to come up with a plan that we think will work there. Um, best they plan to just that, that. I'm sure that we'll have to make accommodations as we go. But certainly, the increased traffic in that neighborhood is a risk. And then there's always the small versus large. Uh, you know, 
what are our students there about the teachers and how have you? That is one of the benefits of having small class sizes. Those relationships are so much easier to build in a class of 10 or 11 than it is in a class of 24. But it is not, it is not equitable to other students, and it is also, it is also not financially feasible to continue to do that. I will tell you that a 600 student intermediate school will seem very large to us because that is our perspective is in small elementary schools. But in the whole scheme of things, a 600 student school is not very large at all. It is large to us, and I do, I mean, I absolutely, I don't want to take away from that. I certainly get that it is different. But if you compare across the state, across the nation, 600 student elementary school is really not that large. However, there are a lot more on the rewards side of things. We're going to have an improved 21st century learning environment. Ms. Davis and I were talking about this today. These teachers have, did, have done such a tremendous job. I can't even imagine what will happen when they're teaching with up-to-date technology and up-to-date classrooms that are built around collaboration, that are built around 21st century skills. They, I mean, I don't think accreditation is even going to be an issue. I think we're going to be knocking it out of the park and doing things that we ought to be doing anyway that the state really kind of keeps us from doing, which is project-based learning, hands-on, experiential learning. Those are the things that we want to be doing and we should be doing. And I think in this new environment, it'll make it much, much easier to do so. This plan provides equity for all students. It won't matter what street you live on. You will be going to the nicest school Bristol has to offer, regardless of where you live. The long-term savings, I've showed you that slide, are tremendous. Energy efficiency will be much, much better. The ability to attract business and industry and people to, to move into our neighborhood, which also has a good financial impact on our city, will be phenomenal. The increase in property values will help the city. It will a few homeowners will not like it because their assessments will go up and they'll have to pay more in taxes. But overall, that is definitely a benefit. Um, it, it, those things cause us to have a potential for revenue generation. We're talking about a budget neutral plan now. When we, when we sell any of these properties, immediately this proposition becomes budget positive. Because we're already at neutral. When we sell these buildings, we get that money, we can apply that towards the loan, and then whoever buys it will get paying property taxes on it. And so that money will then go into the city's coffers, and so it will be a budget positive, a revenue generating proposal. I tell you this right now. I'll bet you a, a dollar to a dollar. You can't, you know, I should be talking about waiting for the single account, but I'll bet you a dollar to a dollar that you can't find another locality who has an opportunity to build a school and make money. If you, I don't care where you look, you won't find that. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I've already mentioned the $6 million city surplus and the fact that there is no need for our residents to have a tax increase. And I'm almost done. Um, you know, some of the recent philosophies about some of the th good things that are happening in Bristol, we've been told to think big or go home. Folks, this is a big idea, and this is a big opportunity, and it's not something that comes along all every day. As a matter of fact, this is a generational opportunity. We've not had this opportunity at least since 2011, and we may not have it again. But if we follow through and we make this happen, we will change the face of our city. We will change the face of education in the city of Bristol for generations. My dad, in the 1940s, attended this very school. His dad was illiterate, signed his name with an X. His mom, my grandmother, was the laundry lady at the Bristol Hospital. Neither one of them were illiterate. But this school system provided my dad with an education and the means for him to break that cycle. And his boys have had different levels of success but because of this school system that poured into my father in the 30s. I'm in an opportunity now where I can lead this division and hopefully have a similar impact on all the students that are going through here now. That's the kind of change that this school can have for our community. You know, we're only asking for consent to move forward. We're not asking for any additional money from the city. We're not asking for the city to be obligated to pay the 
lease. It's not a, it's not a loan. It's not a bond. It's a lease. All we're asking for is their blessing. Uh, this is a private project, which is very highly talented in our city, with the street team taking all the risks. This is a game changer. I mentioned that already. This has impact, potential impact, a huge positive impact on our economy. And then I'll ask you this. Let's say city council votes no. Votes no. We know the conditions of our buildings. We know the cost of land buildings. If not this, tell me what. If not now, tell me when. I don't have the answer for that. Our school board has been looking for that answer since 2011. If we don't do it now, folks, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think there's a good answer if we don't choose this solution. That's not my decision. It is my job to convince this board to approve a comprehensive agreement in the very near future and to convince city council that this is the best thing for our students. And that's what I intend to do. So.